thanks for joining me, Bradley. Um, it's great to have you here. Um, obviously, we've known each other for quite a while, uh, drawn to each other, I think, by our, our shared heritage, but also, more importantly, I think our passion for this space and what this technology can do and the utility behind it. Um, obviously, you're at checkout.com, uh, one of the largest payment uh, groups in the world, and was an early player in, in the crypto space. And Purus, you obviously were, were critical in that evolution and the start of it. Can you talk to me a little bit about, about that? Sure. I, I would love to take that compliment and say I was crit uh, crucial, but I really was not. It was almost an accident that we fell into the space. Mm -hmm. I mean, checkout.com, we're a global acquirer processor, so a full stack payments provider. Mm -hmm. Our core vertical, though, well, we have a few, but fintech has always been a very strong footprint for us. And if you think about the kind of tooling that you need to support money remitters, neobanks, brokerages, it's very, very similar to what crypto exchanges and on-ramps need as well. Um, it was actually one of uh, our aspiring sales guys in the UK who actually just boarded a crypto exchange without us really understanding what it was that mm. had come through. Um, it also was quite surprising to us how different processing in crypto is, the levels of fraud and things like that you can see. You definitely need more guardrails in place. But we got comfortable fairly quickly. I think we'd love to say that we were clairvoyant and were ahead of the curve and realized crypto would be everything it became. Um, but I think we were just open to the future. And once we'd worked out that we can tweak our platform, make sure the controls are in place, make sure fraud and risk is kept to a minimum, but still applying our core tool set that serves you know, the largest fintechs in the world, it became almost a foregone conclusion. And almost every crypto exchange we talked to, every on-ramp, yeah, they were slightly underserved. There's a lot of acquirers who, who didn't want to operate in that sector, and obviously that's their prerogative. But in our world, I think that as long as people are able to show that they passed the sniff test, they have good due diligence in place, good controls, and obviously working with customers like Coinbase, uh, like Crypto.com, like MoonPay, I mean, this has been great for us, and obviously it became a very core vertical of our business. Um, as time went by, we were able to also understand the underlying power of blockchain technology. So the idea of is settling in stable coins internationally potentially more efficient than using Swift or Wire, obviously it's something we're keeping an eye on. At checkout, our job is to move value efficiently peer to peer, consumer to business, business to consumer, and business to business. And if blockchain can help us unlock more efficient ways of doing that, then obviously it's going to be something we'll, we'll be looking at. Yeah, maybe diving into the um, on-ramp uh, use case and off-ramp use case. I mean, obviously, we, we work with a number of shared partners, um, Zero Hash on the um, crypto uh, movement piece, the, the regulatory aspects, the technology aspects, and yourselves on, on, on the fiat side. Uh, it'd be helpful maybe to unpack what are on-ramps, what are off-ramps, why do they serve a purpose? Why do they exist? And I think also the evolution, frankly, of on-ramps and off-ramps. I mean, we've seen, for example, a lot of what people would call crypto-native on-ramps and off-ramps, and then groups such as Stripe now uh, building um, on-ramp and off-ramp products. So if you can maybe, that you've been in this space a while, not to age you, but, uh, <laughs> or this space clearly ages us all, but you know, it'd be great to kind of see that, 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 that thread that you, that you see sitting back now, you know, a few years later. Yeah, I mean, the on-ramps deserve a lot of credit because they brought synergy across disparate product types. And if you look at the aspects that we're providing and that you're providing, Checkout could, for example, do the pay inside. We can do the pay outside. We can do a lot of the transactional fraud screening on the fiat leg. Mm -hmm. um, that's kind of three core pillars, pay-ins, pay-outs, fraud screening are, again, three different products. On the zero hash side, well, you know, custody, compliance, swaps, you're doing the other side of that coin. Yep. So if you put those two together, you have most of actually the products that an on-ramp needs to get up and running. You could add in KYC, liveness, IDV, these sort of tools as well. So there's definitely supplemental things that probably want to use, you know, TRM, elliptic, chainalysis, one of these guys to do additional screenings. Uh, but fundamentally, an on-ramp is a combination of those products, pay-ins, pay-outs, fraud screening, custody of the asset, both fiat assets or digital assets, mm -hmm compliance, making sure that you're doing things safely, and of course, the swaps, actually moving the fiat into crypto and then also moving cryptos into other cryptos. Yeah, <clears throat> no, fascinating. And then I think what's interesting about is the utility piece. And you're, you know, last time we, we chatted, uh, it was like roles reversed, and you managed to pull <laughs> out to me that I was a, a Taylor Swift fan, and I gave the, the true use case of why Taylor Swift is a, is a perfect use case for crypto, you know, with the issue with Ticketmaster, how you could build an NFT for her tickets, totally. you know, the whole issue around the ownership of her songs, same story there. I mean, 
if you can reveal anything personal about yourself about use cases, that would be great as well. But like, <laughs> what are the use cases? What are the utility? Why, why does this technology even exist? Would be, would be, because I think people, you know, if you've been in the space a while, you kind of just get it. But I think that is actually a, a core question that a lot of people are thinking about. It's a good question, though, because I don't think we actually have realized any of the potential. Well, there's a lot more of the potential to be seen yeah. in, the, in the years to come, put it that way. I think that, you know, almost using an analogy of having like a young son myself now, mm -hmm. crypto is still a toddler. It's running around, it's screaming randomly, throws tantrums every now and again, falls over, breaks stuff. But what it's doing is playing and learning by playing. And look, I don't begrudge anyone for making an NFT series and selling them for millions of dollars or 50 ETH or whatever it's going to be. Mm -hmm. um, likewise, I don't mind if people want to launch a meme coin like Doge or Pepe. Like, by all means, go ahead. But fundamentally, they're not solving real world problems. And I think it's always been that case with technology is that the world in general is a meritocracy. And technology very much is, lives and breathes that, that truth. Mm -hmm. Uh, so the question to ask is really, where does blockchain look more efficient than what potentially we see today? Or where does it improve or enhance on what's already available? And when it comes down to the kind of the token side of it, I think that, you know, three of the properties of blockchain, is it public, is it immutable, and is it trustless? Mm -hmm. And there's many environments where this is true. If you're buying a house or a car, you know, it needs to be immutable, it needs to be a perfect record, it needs to be trustless. You probably don't know the person who you're buying the house from ahead of time. Um, and then, of course, it needs to be public. It has to be a ledger that anyone can query, a realtor, a, a, you know, a city council with liens or whatever it may be. That's a very good use of blockchain. Title insurance, I mean, how much do you pay when you buy a house for this title insurance thing? That could just completely disappear. So you're talking about efficiencies. If you're a realtor, to using your example of uh, being a Swifty, you know, the NFT you get as a ticket could have utility aspects. You could get a 5% discount when you've been to three of her shows before, or they can send you videos after the, after the performance. Um, but the same would be true in, in the, the real estate world where the NFT, which represents a house, could have lots of NFTs underneath it, so it would be a soul-bound token potentially. Does that seem like it's more efficient than what we have today? Oh, yes, it is. From the Taylor Swift example, does that enrich the branding experience? Does it allow her to connect more closely with her fans? Yeah, absolutely. That NFT has properties that a physical ticket or even a digital one just wouldn't have natively. Um, the other side, of course, is that using the ticketing example is a good one because one of the things that many artists hate is their fans getting ripped off by scalpers. Mm -hmm. So if you imagine that you have the ability with a smart contract to lock in the resale price, maybe you say it has to be the initial price of the ticket, there is no resale market, bye-bye scalpers, you just got rid of a pretty nefarious group of people. Or you may say, well, actually, I'm an artist who I'm okay to make a bit more money, um, but I only want people to sell as a maximum double the price of the ticket. But of that 100% markup, you can build in royalties to these contracts. 10% can go to the venue, 50% to the artist, 40% yeah. to the person reselling the ticket. It creates new economic models that are that much more efficient. And we're starting to see this even on the payment side in crypto with things like account abstraction. Um, you know, if, if you're a, a trader or an FX broker or a, even a lawyer in some cases, having smart contracts do that work for you just increases efficiencies. Um, I mean, that was the initial promise of blockchain is allowing individuals just through one intermediary, the L1 itself, be it the Bitcoin blockchain or the Ethereum mainnet, to interact in that way. And I think that these are the use cases that now we've moved past, hmm, for now, we've moved past the speculative period. I think you're going to start seeing real innovation that comes out, but always under that banner and able to answer the question of what problem are we solving for. You know I'm a huge stablecoin enthusiast. Um, again, I use that example in the introduction. Swift, wires, five days, money gets lost frequently, very easy to fat finger your, your account number wrong. Um, you don't know where you're sending it to. There are no cryptographic proofs. It costs 35 bucks. I mean, imagine doing that on chain on a proof of stake network. You can now send funds around the world. A worker in a foreign country, often an emerging market, can receive 100 cents on the dollar. Today, they're lucky if they receive 70. So this is also something which genuinely helps with things like financial inclusion and is probably more relevant today in emerging markets and helping really uplift people out of poverty. I know that sounds like a grandiose statement, but if you're giving someone 30% more revenue for the work they're doing, I mean, that's a pretty compelling reason to build these products. Yeah, no, I, th I think grandiose, it's not grandiose, I think it's, it's worth doing it, right? I mean, I think that, that, that's really, really important. I think diving into that 
payroll or whatever you want to call it, right? This, this vertical of cross-border payments, cross-border remittances. We've spent a lot of time talking about that. I mean, so, so the, the core value that you see, I mean, this is what people, I think often we take a very either US-centric approach or kind of whatever you want to call it, Western-centric approach. I mean, what, what, what I found really, really illuminating is, you know, for example, we pay a bunch of our Brazilian team in um, crypto. And it's yep. using crypto more as an alternative payment mechanism as opposed to anything else. And I think that's often what's missed. And really unpacking the reasons why they do that is fascinating. So maybe some of the conversations that you've had, obviously we've spoken about it, but you know, why does it matter? Is it just given more to the end customer or what are these pieces? I mean, first to compare the networks. So let's just use Swift versus yep. sending it on an L1. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe not L1, something like Polygon, where the cost is literally zero or Stellar or Solana or, you yep. know, there's, or Lightning. I mean, all of these networks yep. are viable. They're all, multi-asset class now as well. Yes, you can send the native token, but invariably you can also send at least one type of stable coin, in many cases, many more. Um, you compare any of these to Swift, and you could just look at it as a, a chart. Mm -hmm. Time to receive funds, five days versus five minutes. Cost, $35, zero. Yep. Uh, ensuring that you know that person, well, look, blockchain, I mean, even you know, the FBI and CIA have come out and said there's the Blockchain is a much better way of actually tracking money movements than what exists today. The UK government. It, UK government has said it. Yeah. It is safer. So let's like dispel some of the rumors. There are a lot of bad actors in crypto, and there are, and there's been a lot of bad behavior. But done in the right way, sending transactions internationally on chain is just better across the board, faster, cheaper, yep. safer. <clears throat> I mean, when you've got those three things, that's a pretty powerful trifecta. I think in the case of your Brazilian colleagues, or again, let, let's really kind of amp up the example here. Let's go with Argentina, mm -hmm. or people working maybe in Turkey where inflation has been crazy. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you have 102% inflation in Argentina and you send someone a wire in US dollars, not only do you have all of the costs we mentioned previously, yep. but their bank will force a conversion into pesos. And again, they lose another maybe 20% in some cases in these markets. So there's huge hemorrhaging. Now, if you're in that market, you'd much rather hold US dollar because it's a form of capital preservation. And you can imagine a future where you know, derivatives markets exist all over the world, and the idea that you could make a synthetic version of the S&P 500 in a DeFi environment allowed someone holding USDC to get access to what has historically been the best capital market in the world, the US, that's again global financial inclusion. Yep. There's definitely like safeguards and risks, and you want to obviously watch out for liquidity. There's definitely problems in these models, but the optionality you give that person putting money into a bank account where fundamentally they just don't trust their local banking environment in many cases, or allowing them to self-custody and be the master of their own destiny if they want to swap that USDC in you know, Argentina, Las Cuevas, like hey, there's many ways you can do this, they can do so, they can get cash yeah. in hand. Um, but that is still one of the biggest problems, and obviously this is something that I think you and I have talked about as well, is first mile in crypto remains painful. On-ramps are absolutely a requisite, but it's, it's not easy to get money or value from fiat into the digital format today. But just on the other side of that, of that equation, it's hard to off-ramp. And payments, as you know, is an incredibly, the mantra of international business, go global, think local. I'm always, I'm going payments guys, I'm always gonna think payments is the specialist unicorn. But every country you go to around the world, it changes radically how people pay. So you have to then have all of these last mile integrations to local payment networks. But there is, of course, a vision of the future where everything is digital native. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what we're creeping towards. You can see there's actually a bipartisan movement in the US around stable coins. It's very rare you get that these days. Um, obviously, Mika in Europe has clearly laid out yep. what stable coins can be. The pathway is set. But once regulation is in place, you can see a future where banks, like FDIC banks, will be able to issue a digital version of the dollar based on real dollars held on their balance sheets. And suddenly, stable coins and all the benefits they bring goes from bleeding edge to table stakes. And I think that's going to happen much faster than people know. Yeah. I think also that the point that you mentioned about um, Argentina and Turkey, I think, I think Jeremy um, from Circle um, was, was in Congress, and he, he, he mentioned the point um, around that we are in a, effectively a currency um, war about um, whether the dollar versus other pieces. And I think, you know, I think obviously he's talking to a certain audience, but it's a technology pl play there. But I think it is to some degree tying back um, that, that point to certain objectives. Um, that, 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 that certain politicians or other people have. Yeah. Um, I think it's about, you know, this is a technology that can disrupt a lot of pieces. Um, well, that's an interesting point you made, though, because I do think we need to separate. Yeah. Technology should not be a political issue by itself. Yeah. The applications of technology absolutely can be. Yes. And I think that's what we're seeing right now is, is it's, it's a conflation of everything that could be blockchain, DLT, crypto, 
it's all the same thing. It's all lunar terror. It's all FTX. It's like, well, no, guys, let's pull this apart and understand what went wrong in each of these situations. And there's always a rational or maybe not rational, but a logical reason as to why things played out the way they did. Yeah. Sometimes it's human greed, sometimes it's human error, but sometimes you know, regulators do have an important role to play in fostering innovation and putting in guide, guardrails for people to, to be able to follow along. Mm -hmm. um, you talk about US dollar, like US dollar hegemony. I mean, I think the central bank reserves is around 57% of the global reserves are held in US dollar today. Yeah. I mean, I'm a big Ray Dalio fan. Um, I do think that he's probably right about the cycles he talks about and the stage the U.S. is in. I don't think you know, this country is going to be easy to service the debt unless you monetize it. And that basically means bringing in some level of QE, most likely, which of course leads to inflation. You do that over time, and that will weaken the dollar's position more than anything else. But fundamentally, what you want are people's hands reaching for dollars. They've been doing that massively over the last couple of years, because obviously against the dollar, their currencies have been inflating. Um, however, you know, does crypto help with that mission, assuming that the US wants to preserve that position? Well, I think it does. We just talked about it in regards to your workers. They would want to hold US dollars. They would want to use those. So I think dollars reaching for, or sorry, hands reaching for dollars, it's a good thing in terms of how the US should be perceiving stable coins. The real question comes in, what should stable coins be? How should they be regulated? What does a CBDC mean? And you know, we're early, and we are. But I do think that Mika in Europe has done a very good job of providing a framework that others can definitely lean on. And the regulation in the US that's, as I said, in the early stages, but is looking promising, I think it's quite well written too. So I'm, I'm always going to be bullish on these sort of things because you can very logically understand the problems that they are solving. And those problems are real today. Yep. Uh, last question, and you know, you, not to frame you as a, as a stable coin maximalist, or, <laughs> but um, it would be interesting to unpack just, just, just a little bit about, obviously, it feels like just a memory, but really it wasn't very long. Um, obviously, USDC, which is one of, the, I think, perceived as one of the most trusted staple coin coins out there, and obviously huge distribution. I think you know, it teetered around fifty billion dollars in, in, in issuance. How did the um, you know, DPEG that was obviously caused by um, you know the the, the, the holdings at, um, mm -hmm. at at a bank that was obviously under a lot of stress. How, how did that change your view at all? How did it change your view of how it could be it could could be used? Because for me, it made it very very clear that in my mind, USDC is a really really clear alternative payment mechanism. And effectively, if you can bring in and out, there's a huge amount of benefits. You spoke about speed, cost, and other pieces. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, at the end of the day, there is a benefit of actually holding USD. You know, FDIC insured. You can get interest on it. Um, how did it change your your view? It was just a reminder that we need regulation. Again, there's definitely a place in the world for the true you know, degen philo philosophy to thrive. Everyone self-custodies, everyone holds their own private keys, DeFi, DEXs, that's it. But for many people, that's not going to be feasible. I mean, I lose my password to my <laughs> email account like at least once a year. So you know, I have private keys, and they stress me out that I have to you know, tear them up and put them in different locations so that no one can get access to them. And I think we have to understand that for probably the majority of people in the world, that's not going to be a palatable way to to manage your wealth and your money. So by all means, regulate it. Because what we really want to encourage here is the underlying technology's adoption, blockchain. The fact that it's USDC or another stable coin running on blockchain, um, we should enable that and encourage it. But then what do we need? Well, we need a very liquid environment. And of course, bank runs can happen. The SVB bank run had nothing to do with crypto. Let's be very clear about that. It was to do with the hold to maturity positions they had on US treasuries, which were averaging 1.68% interest which was really a human error, a hedge that interest rates should stay zero for another decade, which obviously they didn't. So a lot of banks have been caught in a similar situation, and that actually dates back to another piece of regulation that was made after the GFC to try and increase the stability of banks, encouraging them to hold treasuries effectively, or mortgage-backed securities. Now, if we look at the situation with Circle and what went wrong there, or USDC, was I would argue this is, it was a problem created by lack of regulation. Because there's only a subsection of banks, SVV obviously yep. famous for being a very important part of the US ecosystem, the number of like billion, billion dollar companies that they've helped fund over the years. I mean, and that obviously drives the US economy forward. It drives innovation across the human species forward. I mean, SVV have served a really important purpose. We should never forget that. Um, but there's only a limited number of banks who are willing to kind of take a risk. Mm -hmm. And the reason is they are taking a risk in some ways because you never know what the future regulation may state. So in the absence of regulation, a lot of the especially larger banks uh, weren't partaking in custody of US dollars for Circle or for Paxos or for anyone else. 
um, that led to a concentration risk. Because mm -hmm. in a perfect world with regulation, every bank would be comfortable knowing that a stable coin is this, and I can treat it as a cash equivalent. And then every bank would be comfortable taking deposits from Circle or anyone else. Mm -hmm. And then you wouldn't have the concentration risk that we saw with SVB. So genuinely, that's a problem that would never come up again when regulation's in place, because if you're Circle, of course, you know, you can see a future where they're going to be like, we're going to have our money across 100 bank accounts, yep. and that would be prudent. So it didn't really change my opinion. It really just reminded me that in absence of regulation, or the role of regulators in fostering innovation, yep. and it may seem sometimes counterintuitive because they can be viewed as the opposite, but again, providing people clear guardrails, it allows you to operate your business securely and in the knowledge that you're not going to get a knock on the door from a regulator, law enforcement, or anyone else down the line. So I feel like regulation in this space is inevitable. Mm -hmm. And that inevitability, you're basically removing the only weak point that exists today with stable coins, which is lack of liquidity and concentration risk, both of which are very easy to solve. Yep. Well, thank you, Freddie. On that note, um, thanks for your time, and um, great to see you. Cheers, Ed.